We, you know, Darwin used to like to talk about the simple cell. We've all heard about the so-called simple cell. It turns out it doesn't exist. The simplest cell we can encounter has unparalleled complexity and adaptive design. It has a central memory bank. It has assembly plants and processing units, repackaging and shipping centers, robot machines, protein molecules that are robot machines, typically consisting of 3,000 atoms in three-dimensional configurations. It has hundreds of thousands different specific types. It has elaborate communication systems and quality control and repair mechanisms throughout. If we were to make a model of a simple cell, let's imagine a model that's 1,000 million times larger than reality. In other words, a billion larger than reality. Each atom, we'll assume, will be about the size of a tennis ball. We will need 10 million million atoms, 10 to the 13th. If we counted one per minute, it would take 19 million years just to count these. I want you to get a feeling for the scope of this, so this imaginary model. It would be over 10 miles in diameter. It's a, so the real cell, of course, has a, is enclosed by a plasma membrane, which has gateways that control exchanges going in and going out with signal receptors. The internal material they call cytoplasm, inside of which is the nucleus. That's actually an information center with a master library that has all the background they need. There's a nucleus, nucleolus, which is the automated factories that manufacture products that will be used by the cell. There are a number of mitochondrions, which are the power plants, the sources of energy to have all this activity go on. It has what they call the Golgi apparatus, which is for processing, packaging, shipping, and preparing for export from the cell. And there are all kinds of other functions for storage and transport and trash disposal. This is literally a miniature city. There are automated factories in the cell, robot machines, hundreds of thousands of different types that have an artificial language and decoding systems, memory banks for information storage, elegant control systems for automated assembly of the components. They prefab and use modular construction. They have error fail-safe and proofreading devices for quality control and on it goes. When I was an executive, for, I spent some years as a senior executive with Ford Motor Company. In those days, in Dearborn, one of our proudest assets was the Ford River Rouge plant, a plant on the River Rouge. The Ford River Rouge plant is the largest integrated manufacturing plant in the world. Let's take a quick look at it. It, it has ore docks where raw ore comes in. It has steel furnaces, coke ovens rolling mills, glass furnaces, and plate glass rollers. It makes its own steel, its own glass, and its own paint. It consists of 93 buildings, a tire making plant, a stamping plant, an engine casting plant, a frame and assembly plant, a radiator plant, tool and die plant, paper mill, and a soybean conversion plant. So you have raw materials enter this complex. It is supported with a massive power plant 120 miles of conveyors, 100 miles of railroad track, and at the time, 16 locomotives. Can you get, get this picture? Out of, the raw ore comes in one end, and new cars come out the other end, one every 49 seconds. That's the River Rouge plant, well worth a tour, even a day with its reduced scale. Let's make a technology comparison. The Ford River Rouge plant has raw limestone, iron ore, coal going one end. It manufactures its own steel gla and glass and paint. It has an automated engine manufacturing line. It assembles mixed models, options, and colors. New cars exit the other end. So get that in your picture, in your mind. The simple cell is more complex than the Ford River Rouge plant in Dearborn, Michigan, and the cell can do something that the River Rouge plant can't do. It can replicate its entire structure within a few hours. The River Rouge plant can't do that. So you need to understand the complexity of what we're dealing with here. Now the code that drives all this was uh, uh, deciphered, if you will, by Watson and Crick in, in their famous landmark publication in Nature Magazine 1953. And, of course, in recent years, the big move was to map the human genome. The basic building blocks 
inside this area is amino acids. Amino acids are the components from which proteins are made. Of the hundreds of amino acids that are known, only 20 are used by living systems in the construction of proteins. And incidentally, only the ones that are left-handed. If you have an asymmetrical molecule, it can be either left or right-handed. It turns out that all amino acids that are used in living tissues are left-handed. The right-handed ones are actually lethal, which tells you, by the way, it couldn't happen accidentally. Because if you have randomness, you'll have half of each, and half of them will destroy the other half. No, there's something guiding all this. Most proteins are simply a linear sequence of somewhere between 100 and 500 amino acids. Some are hydrophobic, that is, they are insoluble in water, and some are hydrophilic, and they are soluble in water. We'll come back to that. But the 20 amino acids that make up life are listed here, and I won't go through them and mispronounce them, but uh, these are obviously well known to those of you that are in microbiology. Half of them are hydrophobic. They're non-soluble in water. They're called nonpolar. The other half are polar or soluble in water. Of the ones that are soluble, some of them are basic, that is, they, uh, they're positively charged, and some of them are acidic, have an extra electron, if you will. And so those are the, those are the basic building materials. Now, proteins are basically a chain of these things, and I'll just take three as an example. The triazine molecule there is a hydrocarbon of a certain structure. It's not important to us what it is. Glutamine is, a, again, a hydrocarbon, different, different combination of hydrocarbons, and valine, a, a different set of hydrocarbons. The point is, each one of these molecules have an amino group and a carboxyl group that cause them to chain, intrinsically become a chain, and that becomes very critical to the whole structure. Now, there is an alphabet, a nucleic alphabet, that is a three out of four error-correcting digital code. The DNA is coded with four, an alphabet of four, adenine, thymine, quinine, and cytosine, and we're, we're going to just abbreviate those with the letters, an ATGC. It turns out those molecules are such that they have a natural affinity in pairs. You can take those, you can take three of those four, and by using three of those four, you can code any one of the 20 amino acids that make up life. You actually even have some space for punctuation, stop and start codes, if you will. But that's the DNA code. And it can be presented another way, circularly, but that is the famous DNA code. And it has start and stop codes and so forth. We can take those in pairs. The A's and the T's and the G's and C's have a tendency to naturally link with each other. So if we make a molecule of a chain of those things, it will intrinsically pull a matching pair alongside it, if you will. When it splits right down the middle, the matching pairs will join them, and this, in effect, gives you a code that is intrinsically, that will copy itself, because you can tear this in half and end up with two copies of the same thing. It's an intrinsically self-replicating uh, code because of the complementary pairs. Now, the way this all works, the DNA is the master blueprint for everything else going on. But you don't, you don't take it out of the library. You make a copy of it to work from, a working copy. So you transcribe the DNA into what's called an RNA. That's like a photocopy, if you will. And that RNA will be used then at the factory floor to manufacture the proteins that become the functional machines that are going to be need, needed. Now, the crick dogma was that you go from DNA to RNA to proteins. You can't go backwards. We now discover that's not true. There are things called retroviruses. There are diseases that can get in the proteins that will actually go back and alter the master record. And that's where we get genetically transmittable diseases. Now, if we take the DNA, what happens, interestingly enough, you take a stream of codes that make up the DNA. You, want, you make a copy of that called the RNA. Then the RNA is, is, is edited. They take certain, the machines take certain segments out of it. These are called introns. They're removed. And uh, what's left is resealed up to be the messenger RNA that goes to the factory floor. The point I'd like to make is interesting is that we have here an equidistant letter sequence, the same kind of codes that we find in the Bible, strangely enough. These introns are labeled in many textbooks as junk DNA. Scientists felt that the 
the introns were removed because they apparently have no functional purpose in producing proteins, so they thought that these are just left over from evolution or some past time. They call it junk DNA. The shocker is they now have discovered two things. Number one, that these, the junk DNA, as it's called, actually is, has an architectural role in what follows. But the really, the big shocker to me was to discover that, you know what percent of the DNA was considered junk DNA? 95%. It's only 5% that's actually uh, focused on for the proteins. Now, when you get the RNA, there's a slight change in the code, but it works the same way. Instead of the ATGC, we're going to have AUGC, but that, that's uh, just a mechanical thing. And those four letters we're going to take a look at. If we take messenger RNA that is a sequence of protein that we want, there are recording heads. The transfer to RNA comes by, and there, it operates like a recording head in the recording studio. As it moves, it pulls together it assembles the proteins that are encrypted in the codes that it's reading. And that's the way it will build a, a, the sequence of amino acids that will make up the protein that it's after. It can make up several hundred thousand different kinds of machines. This is a machine building another machine. Now, negatively charged groups will associate with positively charged groups. The hydrophobic side of the chains will stack in the center, and the hydrophilic will, that, that will arrange themselves in surface contact to depending on its polarities and depending on its relationship to water, it will take a three-dimensional shape that allows it to perform the functions that is designed for. The final stable three-dimensional shape, the minimum energy conformation, is dictated by spe the specific amino acid sequence. <laughs> Thank you.